This episode brought to you by Robinhood. Get the most for your retirement. Hey folks, we're starting YouTube memberships. If you want access to emojis, polls, behind the scene videos, and other perks, check out and see if you want to become a member. And we'll be at Midwest Gaming Classic in Wisconsin in early April. Hope to see you there. Faster than a speeding bullet. I swear that never happens. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. But he can also fly, so it's a tad less impressive when you know that. Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! Well, I'm not looking up for any of those things. It's Super Monk! Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember, so you don't have to. Why is everything still black and white? I thought it would look more like the Snyder Cut. Look, Fraud, why hired you to do the Critic Cut of the Snyder Cut? I expect you to be professional! Maybe your office is so eye-bleedingly red, all you can see is black and white. Fix it! <sighs> Much better. Why did you have me edit this again? Because I already reviewed Justice League, and because I edited that, somebody else has to edit the review of the Snyder Cut. Isn't that backwards? Now you're understanding the DCEU. Is my 10-hour edit ready? Yes. Wonderful. But I crammed it all into 25 minutes. But the 10 hours are still in there, right? Sure. Snyder Cut, baby! <laughs> It's pretty well known that while Zack Snyder's name is on the original Justice League, a family tragedy caused him to step down and the studio had Joss Whedon finish the edit and reshoots. Since its disappointing response though, fans have demanded for years the Snyder Cut of the film be released. Like there is just a finished edit sitting around Warner Brothers they wouldn't let anyone watch. What kind of crazy people do you take them for? There's no way you could get a tax write off with that. Nevertheless, in 2021, Snyder got the go-ahead from Warner to edit and even finish shooting his version of the film. Now, I'll be totally honest, I didn't think it was gonna be that great. Snyder's a talented filmmaker, but I don't think he always understands the important center of his characters. In Batman v Superman, I still don't know why Batman is fighting Superman. <laughs> However, I like seeing people's untampered vision of something. I find it interesting. Star Wars was clearly great because people stepped in and gave Lucas advice. But man, Phantom Menace is one of the most fascinating examples of people just never telling somebody no. Well, Warner said yes several times here, allowing Snyder to shoot it in the IMAX ratio like he intended, giving a pretty hard R rating, and even having it clock in at four hours. Words can't explain how excited I was to see this implode on itself, but at least an artist would finally have his untampered vision. And with all the jokes and criticisms I've made over the years mocking this guy's take on the DCEU, this is not only my favorite DCEU movie of his, but it might be my favorite movie of his, period. It is so drenched in visual storytelling, gripping atmosphere, and a tone that balances its epic scale, but also quiet reflection. Sure, there's a ton of talking in it, but there's also a ton of visuals, and both help each other tell the story the same way an epic comic book does. I truly was shocked how much I enjoyed this flick, and I'm gonna go into detail why. So now that my vision of the review has finally been edited... Yep, I didn't leave anything on the cutting room floor. Good to know. Let's wrap up Super Month with the Snyder Cut. Okay, Zach, you want us to like your DCEU films? Maybe don't remind us of your DCEU films. Well, it's already more cyborg in this cut than we've seen in the Whedon version. I will say the only thing I miss from the original edit is the Everybody Knows song. I was actually surprised that wasn't a Snyder choice, but it already sets up the mystery of the mother boxes much better without even uttering a word of dialogue, as we see them seemingly come to life with Superman's death. Just the buildup of this cautious Amazon approaching this thing is far more tension than anything in the original. Except that one shot we all agree that's the one good moment in the film. <laughs> Wayne goes searching for Aquaman, so he asks Aquaman if he's seen him. There's a stranger who comes to this village from the sea. He comes in the winter when the people are hungry. He brings fish. Which is kind of like killing family. You know, if I want Whedon jokes, I watch the Whedon version. And that said, it is interesting comparing these two alternatives. Like, both these scenes get across the same thing, but Whedon's version only sticks to the essential information with an occasional joke. It's tight and quick, but you tend not to care because it goes by so fast. Snyder really takes his time, which you think would drag, but it keeps you more invested because the characters are really taking in what the other is saying. Thus, we are too. With that said, I am kind of surprised some dumbbell moments made it into both versions. Fight comes, we'll need you. Don't count on it, Batman. Why not? 
Also, can you call me Shazam around total strangers? But we get the song. <laughs> which people seem to like, but I think it's just odd. So pretty much a typical Snyder experience for me. But seriously, for a four hour flick, this film flies. Like, what would you say we're about three, four minutes in? We're at the 15 minute mark already, and it does not feel like that amount of time has passed. Even if they do repeat some of the same mistakes. Maybe a man who broods in a cave for a living isn't cut out to be a recruiter. I hope this god is in on our secret. Did you hear me scream that back there? The him being Batman part. We get the terrorist attack Wonder Woman foils, except, again, more engaging. We're a small group of reactionary terrorists who want to turn back the clock in Europe a thousand years. Boring. Years. The mindset Whedon had on the first edit. Can I be like you someday? You can be anything you want to be. Eh, yeah, that's a little much, but literally the film ends with her cutting a guy's head off. I think a little levity is welcomed. Stephen Wolf arrives to steal the mother box from the Amazons. And okay, he's still not like an amazing villain, but he's like Loki. When you know Thanos is coming, he's decent enough and gets the job done. <laughs> Snyder's slow-mo is utilized a lot better here too. In a lot of his films, it feels kind of random, but when he uses it here, I feel either how demanding the physical strengths of these heroes are, or what a character is processing. I never thought about these nameless Amazons fighting Steppenwolf, but when the queen in slow-mo slides out of there and looks back at her temple crumbling with all them inside, you feel the same loss she's going through in that moment. But also feel the urgency that she can slow down, she has to keep moving. <laughs> Steppenwolf does get the box though and vanishes with it. You're all fired! They do that lighting Gondor beacon thing, and Diana gets the message. She goes searching for answers by putting the arrow shot in an ancient temple where the future forecast doesn't look great. Again, not one word is uttered here, but looking at these carvings against Diana's reaction is all you need. Brian Singer is going to be the new guest director! Even the song choices affect the pacing greatly. If we went from Diana seeing Darkseid to Aquaman returning to the ocean in slow-mo, both those scenes together would feel too slow. But going from a suspenseful score to a laid-back song offsets these two scenes perfectly. There is a king, there is a king. I can't believe we're actually an hour in at this point. These small additions really do make a huge impact. You're the rightful king of Atlantis. Aquaman is told danger is coming and he should take the throne, but he refuses. The time has come. Take up your mother's trident. I foresee a triumphant future and... You know what's enough. Steppenwolf talks with his superiors, maybe a few too many times as the movie goes on, but again, I do legit listen to what he has to say because we do find out more about him and he's looking for redemption. You betrayed him, your own family. I saw my mistake. I said yes to these effects, but I know better now. We're given DCEU's power non-couple when Wonder Woman meets up with Batman. And once again, these two have crazy good chemistry. Hi there. A new toy? I wish you would be, yes. We're given the backstory of the mother boxes dating back years ago, and, well, I guess it's not a shock the guy who directed 300 can make this interesting. Though it does need more stone goats. His dark side waged war. He found a secret there. A power hidden in the infinity of space. The Infinity Stone Mother Boxes! Which is still a strange name. It sounds like a Hallmark gift. The defenders of Earth attacked and fought as one. Amazons alongside Atlanteans, alongside the Guardians from the sky. It was... familiar but cool. <laughs> they of course won, and the mother boxes were kept safe. Dish. Bruce and Diana decide they need to recruit others to help out in this battle, so they go to Barry Allen in yet another scene that didn't age well when you know more about the actor. <laughs> just had to have a hot dog in that scene, didn't you, Zach? It's like a challenge. How can you connect every scene to a dick somehow? Your son may be captain of the football team, certified genius. We get more info on Cyborg's backstory, an amazing football player who's also a computer genius. 
There's just so many. But his father's always absent, and he seems to be having a nice conversation with his mother, so bye bye <laughs> His father does what he can to bring him back to life, but as you'd imagine, they can't heal the true wounds. Your physical strength is just the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the tip. Every scene, dick. Snyder, ah, finds a way. Like many, I was most impressed with Cyborg's character in this version, as it was very public him and Whedon didn't get along, so he was kept out of a fair chunk of the original film. Here, he's still kept in the shadows, but that's the point. We see him grow in his solitude, learning more about his abilities through one of the most original ways I've ever seen in a superhero movie. His mechanical side allows him to hack into virtually anything, even speak a machine language, and, to some extent, understand what a machine is feeling just by what its purpose is. That could sound really ridiculous and too silly, and, yeah, if they just explained all that verbally, it probably would be but they create this abstract world inside his mind where digital information and his thoughts are literally one. It's one of the coolest and most inventive ways to go inside a superhero's mind, show what he's going through, and how he helps others in need through such a unique way. Because of this, his performance changes too. Now you're reading his facial expressions more because you know there's literally a whole other world existing inside his head. This approach turns Cyborg from the most boring character in the film to the most interesting character in the film. Barry Allen, Bruce Wayne. Meanwhile, Batman goes to visit Barry Allen. A lot of this is about the same as the original, minus the, what, Joss Whedon dialogue added? Like brunch, like, what is brunch? Here I thought Carrie Fisher ghost wrote that scene. I'll be honest, the most emotional part of the movie has nothing to do with the main characters, because when you know why Zack walked away from the original production, that little sign there, it's pretty hard. Diana gets a message on her computer. To be fair, it's how a lot of fans ask Gal Gadot on a date. And of course, it turns out to be Cyborg. Why are you looking for me, Diana? You know who I am. I know more than you can possibly imagine. See, in any other movie, that line would be so forgettable and generic, but because we're allowed to see what he sees and goes through, that's suddenly one of the more badass lines in the film. I don't need anyone. I told myself the same for a long time. I lost someone I loved once. He came back for a bit. I made everyone in the world give up their wish. It was a whole thing. Cyborg once again refuses, but at least they have Barry, who still has the dialogue that once again I'm shocked wasn't written by Whedon. As a bad signal, that's your... Oh, sh sorry. That's your signal. That means we have to go now. It's okay. Everyone else knows. Steppelwolf takes the second mother box from under the sea. Apparently Amber Heard's sudden British accent wasn't enough to stop him. He's short-sighted as he is cruel. Take what men we have left and form a phalanx around the mother box. Oh, rather! And only a regular movie running time in. I think we can show our heroes teamed up in costume now. These lead back to Strikers Island, between the two cities. A bunch of scientists have been kidnapped by Steppenwolf, one of them being Cyborg's father. Thus they go in to try and save him. Do you really think that... Oh, wow, they just... They really just vanish. Huh? Oh. That's rude. You know, can you run back in time and create a paradox where your jokes work in movies? They have a big fight and, well, again, Snyder's pretty good at making visually interesting battles, and this one's no exception. But I never saved anyone before... Yeah, that scene's gone, thank God, that made no sense. joins the party like before, and the last mother box is safe for now. The resurrected dark side is not pleased. I will stride across their bones and bask in the glow of anti-life. He seems nice. We discover Cyborg's father used the mother box to bring him back to life, which means they can use it to bring back the person they don't even have to name. Who's gonna say it? I'm not gonna say it. Oh, right. This is Super Month. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com boost. Subscription fees apply. And now, some legal info. 
Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radio's global market research. Investing involves risk including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC membership SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Hey folks, I'll be playing Final Fantasy VII every Friday on Twitch. I've never played a Final Fantasy game before, so I'm excited to see what they're like. Hope to see you there. They dig up Superman's body and we get one of the most badass lines building him up. You can't bring down the charging bull. Don't wave the red cape at it. You do when it's this red cape. This red cape charges back. Pretty cool. And they sneak into the lab to play God with a god. Oh, by the way, Lois is in this. Yeah, she's about as shoehorned in as she was in the other versions. Anyway, back to cool. There's not enough charge to wake the box. I might be able to do it. Flash uses his super speed to charge up the mother box to charge up Superman, except this time there actually is a point that returns later with time travel. Oh, and it also gives us this disturbingness. Wow, haunting imagery can be effective when you give a shit and it makes sense. He's brought back to life, but his brains are all scrambled up, and he attacks our heroes. Again, a lot of this is like in the original, including, as mentioned, the one good scene from the original. However, Batman's scene is changed up because, well, he just couldn't get there as quickly as the others. Yeah, I don't know why that really makes me laugh. As if he's like, Some of us just have a car. It's a cool car. But Lois appeals to his humanity, and they fly away. Steppenwolf gets the last mother box, despite Cyborg's father sacrificing himself to sabotage it. Yeah, the side character I forgot was even in the original. Actually, pretty sad didn't make it. His father's dead because of us. I told you waking that box was a bad idea. It wasn't a bad idea. It just resulted in an outcome that was bad, from an idea that was bad. Superman and Lois return to his mother's home. And remember that line in the original when she says, you smell good? And you were like, even for Justice League, Joss Whedon, what was that about? You smell good. Did I not before? Well, here's what it was supposed to be. This is home. He spoke. Did I not before? This movie relies so much on visual storytelling, I didn't pick up that he didn't speak either. Everything was communicated just through his expressions and his actions. I also like the first time he speaks is when he's comfortable enough, when he's literally home. It makes sense. Of course, Whedon had to show off his amazing, quippy writing and gerbil teeth effects. So he had to come up with another line there and... He smelled good. Those were words. She loved it here. So did I. There's more of Lois reconnecting soups to his memories, which was definitely needed in the other version. And the rest of our heroes try to form a plan to how to stop Steppenwolf. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells. He's never fought us, not us united. Inspiring words, isn't that right, Superman? Oh, wait. Oh yeah, what was this shit again? He said to me, Lois Lane is the key. I think it's something more, something darker. So dark, you'll literally never see what it's supposed to be. It also looks like Cyborg fixed Bruce's plane he could literally never get off the ground. You fixed it. It wanted to fly. Flight is its nature. Yours too. Oh, that's another thing this movie has. Chemistry. I actually like hearing these people encourage each other. He'll be here, Alfred. I know it. What makes you so sure? Faith, Alfred. Faith. The other films did make it clear he was Space Jesus. The mother boxes fuse into one, and again, showing more of Superman's journey back to himself, his memories call to him as he picks a new pretty rockin' suit. I'm assuming you're Alfred. You said you'd come. Now let's hope... You're not too late. Don't worry, in DC movies, even when it's too late, it's never too late. Except... Our heroes go attack Steppenwolf, and the action's... fine. It is nice seeing the original color scheme, which is to say, no color scheme. But it does look better than God sneezing Kool-Aid powder all over the earth, and they do all work together a lot more in this one, as opposed to just letting the other take turns to fight the threat. They legit function as a team. That's the whole reason we want to see them as a team in the first place. If one of them isn't there, this wouldn't succeed. With that said, they don't succeed. Not the first time, anyway. 
The timing to destroy the box between Flash and Cyborg fails. What to do? I'll just let him explain it. You just gotta go faster than the speed of light, far beyond the speed of light. You gotta break the rule, Barry, and you gotta do it now. And I know I'm gonna sound hypocritical, but this is the spinning the Earth backwards done right. It was not only shown this could kind of be done before, but it's also something that will be done in the future. Make it clear why it's not a good thing to keep doing in the future. And it's also done while dimensions are fusing and powers are merged and there's like a million other weird things going on here that could also connect to how this is possible. It's actually so crazy with so much going on, it kind of acquits itself. I want a Justice League movie, but if we're gonna get Zack Snyder's Justice League? I want it to be as freaking weird as Zack Snyder's Justice League can get. <laughs> Steppenwolf is defeated as pointlessly, but also awesomely violent as possible. Displeasing the coming attraction at characters I'm so pissed off we're never gonna see. We will use the old ways. We could have made her voice Ed Asner's final role! Nevertheless, the day is saved, the Justice League is formed, and all is right with the- what do you mean there's 28 minutes left? Alright, the epilogue. Um... Yeah, I didn't care much for the epilogue. I guess there's nothing really bad in it per se, and again, it is an extended cut, it should go all out, but I mostly call it quits by this point. I just watched a three and a half hour movie that did not feel at all like a three and a half hour movie, but with the epilogue, I instantly feel the film's running time. With that said, some of the stuff's pretty cool. You know I hate Eisenberg's Lex Luthor, but replacing shouldn't we have our own league with... If you want the Batman, his name is Bruce Wayne. That's an upgrade! Seeing the apocalyptic future Batman dreamed about is kinda neat even if it does feature drunken mind Morbius offering sexual favors. You don't want to kill me. Who's gonna give you a reach around? It's Jared Leto's Joker, directed by the guy who made this. Of course he says something like that! But probably my biggest screaming to the gods shouting no moment is when they revealed one of the most underappreciated actors, Harry Lennox, was about to play Martian Manhunter. Your mother and father would be proud. They've called me the Martian Manhunter. This guy is a Shakespearean actor, and I think he would have crushed it as this character in future movies. If they went the makeup route and, you know, not Michael Bay Ninja Turtles covered in JFK lips from Forrest Gump. But yes, for a film I was pretty much reading the playbill to bad for, I absolutely love this movie. <laughs> It has a unique identity that separates it from other superhero films, but doesn't separate it from the past films in its library either, eh, for better or worse. Snyder being allowed to do whatever he wants really shows how well he can let the visuals in a visual medium do most of the talking. I'm not gonna act like this is an amazing script or anything, but its atmosphere and pacing and even some of its ideas are so engaging to me. I feel like it gave me an experience I never had before. One where the superheroes do practically no superheroing until a normal movie runtime would end, and I amazingly didn't mind. It truly feels otherworldly in a way that plays into the strengths of this filmmaker and very little into his weaknesses. It's not the Justice League movie I would expect growing up reading the comics, but that's also kind of what I like about it. It is something different that plays by different rules and gives me something new. They're not groundbreaking rules or anything, but they offer a fascinating point of view that relies more on tone and going slow while also still being bombastic and super energized. I can't say it's like one of the greatest superhero movies to watch, but it is one of the most unique superhero experiences to encounter. And there you go, my special 10 hour review of the Snyder Cut. It just flew by, didn't it? Yes, well that's what happens when you have such an engaging star. Yeah, that's one word for it. Oh, that reminds me, you're still making that three hour Nostalgia Critic intro, aren't you? Yes, and I'm so good that I squashed it down to a few seconds. You're a miracle worker. Well thank you everyone for joining me for Super Month, and you know I've been making fun of Warner Brothers so much, I think it only makes sense to make fun of their competitor. I only wish there was a clear sign that could point me in the right direction for what movie to make fun of. I only wish someone could make it so clear that- Who's gonna give you a reach around? We're continuing cameos for charity and all this month, we're donating to Living Beyond Breast Cancer. 
Living Beyond Breast Cancer is fulfilling its mission to provide trusted information and a community of support to those impacted by the disease. They offer in-person experiences and on-demand emotional, practical, and evidence-based content that is meaningful to those newly diagnosed in treatment, post-treatment, and living with metastatic disease. Having done this for over 30 years and having a four-star rating on Charity Navigator, this is definitely a great one to support. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday or congrats or whatever, click on the link below and be giving to a good cause. Or if you're like, I hate your face, I don't want a cameo from you, still consider looking at this charity anyway. Whether you donate, volunteer, or just spread the word, you can do a lot in helping this wonderful organization out. So click on the link and give it a look. Thanks so much.